A very good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jane Thibangedasalan, the Medical Director of Hospital Fatima. This year, we at Hospital Fatima join forces once again with WHO to celebrate the World Patient Safety Day by dedicating a week of activities and programs in line with the theme Safe Maternal and Newborn Care. Approximately 810 women die every day of preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. In addition, around 6,700 newborns die every day, amounting to 47% of all under 5 deaths. Fortunately, the majority of stillbirths and maternal and newborn deaths are avoidable through the provision of safe and quality care by skilled health professionals working in a supportive environment. Hence, this year, Hospital Fatima will be dedicating this week from 13 September to 17 September, focusing on the above theme. We have a lineup of online activities and talks which will be streamed on our Facebook Live. Please do follow our Instagram, Facebook, and website for more information. Thank you and stay safe always. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I am Akma from the Sales, Marketing and Public Relations Department, Hospital Fatima Ipo, and I'm pleased to announce to you a series of talks lined up for this Patient Safety Week as in conjunction with WHO World Patient Safety Day this year on 17 September worldwide. The theme is Safe Maternal and Newborn Care, and it is indeed our pleasure to have our resident consultant pediatrician, Dr. Lee Kim Singh, with all his expertise and experience in this field, to start off with the first talk entitled Neonatal Care. Dr. Lee Kim Singh graduated from UKM in 1991, obtained postgraduate membership in pediatrics, MRCP from Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, Scotland in 1996. Attached to Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Edinburgh as a specialist registrar between 1996 to 97. Thereafter, he returned to Malaysia, continued service with Ministry of Health in 1997 at Hospital Taiping, gazetted as pediatrician with MOH in 1998 while attached to Hospital Taiping. He then joined Hospital Fatima in July 2000 as the pioneer resident consultant pediatrician, helping with setting up the pediatric medical services at Hospital Fatima. Provide services in hospital-based acute pediatrics, special interest in developmental pediatrics. Dr. Lee believes in importance of sharing and dissemination of knowledge to empower parents and caregivers to be responsible in providing optimal care and nurturing of children and minors whom they care for in a safe, healthy and minors um, from whom they care, sorry, and conducive home through his active engagement in health forums to the public and medical outreach um, volunteerism through various NGOs to reach out for marginalized families and communities. I am sure you are all eager to hear the talk now, which about 45 minutes, and we will have another 50 minutes in our Q&A session immediately after the talk. So it is my pleasure now to introduce to you Dr. Lee Kim Singh. Hello, can you hear me now? Am I now, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me now? Okay, um, right. Okay, um, welcome everybody to this uh, talk. Um, it's a ple great pleasure for me to be one of the speakers uh, for the Hospital Patient Safety Week in collaboration with the O Patient Safety Week, uh, which is going to celebrate uh, between 13th of September to 17th of September. Um, we talk about the theme, which is a safe mother and newborn uh, care. 
is more important uh, during this pandemic season with the uh, see the sort of disruption of the essential care services so it's important to raise awareness uh, uh, regarding a good uh, proper good uh, quality of newborn care as well as maternal care uh, so as to reduce the maternal and child mortality mortality and morbidity the outline of my talk would be uh, first i talk about newborn examination and follow on with some common newborn skin condition because the skin is the largest uh, organ system in our body and many parents actually are very concerned you know when you look at any any abnormality or some suspicious signs and, uh, and, and lesions on the skin itself. And I'll talk about some common concerns among parents as well. The purpose of the newborn examination uh, is for doctors or, and midwives to identify any possible life-threatening conditions and for us to exclude any gross structural for physical deformity as well as to ensure other uh, systems which is functioning well as the child or the baby transition from the fetal uh, in, the, in the in the womb uh, to the real life situation that everything is functioning properly and satisfactorily. Um, we basically will go through the head to toe kind of examination of the baby, uh, looking at the general appearance, the head of the skull, shape and size of the baby's head, the eyes, ear, nose and mouth, uh, down to the chest, heart, uh, abdomen, uh, even the limbs, the hips, spine, neurological and skin. So this is a picture you see baby newborn baby comes in different size and shapes and you can see that these are all these normal newborn babies so we just look at the head and see whether the head is within the normal size or uh, whether there's any if it's uh, for this uh, uh, instrumental delivery we look and see whether there's any possible injury associated with the scalp or the skull and look at the eyes of the baby the nose and the mouth of the baby and the uh, ears of the baby as well for any abnormality and uh, down, uh, further down, we look at the chest, the shape of the chest, and also the way the babies breathe, the tone of the baby, the position of the baby as well. And uh, we go down further to look at the umbilicus of the baby, whether they are normal. Uh, normal baby, they would have uh, two arteries and one vein in the umbilicus. And uh, look at the limbs of the baby, check the digits, and down, go further down, we look at the hips, whether there's any unstable hips. Uh, and look at the uh, foot and the legs if there's any any uh, structural abnormality and the genitalia as well uh, we'll do some simple uh, um, a basic uh, primitive reflex checking like what is shown in this baby here is a fencing position a fencing position here when the head is turned to one side and then the uh, same side the upper limbs will be in extended position whereas the other side will be in the flexion position and the other uh, other primitive reflexes that we check would be moral complex uh, moral reflex, uh, as well as the rooting and also the grasp reflex. As you can see here, when the hand is placed uh, onto the baby's fist, uh, baby actually grabs on it. So these are the few prim normal primitive uh, reflexes that we expect to see in the newborn baby. I go on to see uh, to show some of the common newborns' uh, skin condition, right? Uh, this is a condition called melia, where it's very commonly seen uh, in, in almost uh, more than half of the uh, newborn babies. It's normally distributed around the, around the nose, the face region, under the chin, below the nose, or even something on the forehead. There appears like the small little tiny pearl white kind of lesions on the skin. Uh, this is a normal condition. It doesn't need to get treatment. Normally, it resolve over the next two to three weeks time. Um, after two or three days, uh, some babies, about 50% of babies will have this kind of a rash on the body uh, where there's actually redness uh, at the base and also sometimes some little tiny bumps, you know, looking like, like uh, some mosquito bite or some pustules there. Uh, this is a condition called erythema toxicum. Again, this is a self-limiting condition. It doesn't need to be treated. You probably, if it's so extensive, what you can do, you just give some, apply some moisturizer. And uh, this condition typically resolves within a, a 10, 7 to 10 days period without even without treatment. Most important is reassuring the parents that there's nothing wrong with the skin. Uh, and some babies, when they come about, say, five days to a week, you know, they may actually present with this what we call baby acne. It is actually not an acne per se, uh, but it looks like those tiny bumps, you know, can be red or pearl white. It looks very similar with the, the milia in the first place. But the onset, this will not be at birth itself. This will probably uh, 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 come on about uh, one or two weeks duration. 
it is believed to be due to uh, some inflammatory response uh, to the uh, yeast that colonizes the baby's uh, skin. Uh, again, this is self-limiting in a condition. Within one or uh, one to two, uh, two weeks, it will disappear by itself. Uh, sometimes gentle moisturizer will be adequate, but if it's a very uh, florid extensive, we may actually need to use a low potency steroid uh, just to dampen some of the inflammatory response. And this is nothing of serious uh, concern and it's self-limiting by itself as well. And uh, coming to our uh, our, our climate, if we're hot and humid, you know, it's not uncommon to see this so-called malaria or we call general called pricky heat rash. And this occurs within a week or 10 days after the baby is born. Typically, you can see on the uh, face, uh, over the scalp, as well as uh, over the trunk. Um, the onset is important to differentiate from other, other uh, uh, earlier rash. Uh, it may appear very similar, but the base of the skin normally is not so red and doesn't appear angry or inflamed. Uh, this will be just gentle moisturizer or some, apply some cooling calamine lotion will, re, will, will resolve uh, the, the skin the lesion. Uh, coming to some of the stains which is commonly seen, this is called Mongolian blue spot. It's uh, more obvious or more easily uh, seen in those uh, fair skinned babies. Uh, it appears in these uh, bluish or grayish kind of uh, 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 patches. Typically appears uh, over the trunk, uh, the low low back and sometimes uh, even the uh, extremities. And this is a self-limiting condition. There's nothing need to be uh, worried about. Uh, normally by four to five years old, they will actually resolve spontaneously. The only concern is about the, some of the babies because if we don't notice it, it appears something like a bruise. So it can appear actually either at birth itself or even within the five days or six days after baby is born. Right? So with the proper documentation, you know, this is not a bruise. This is basically a Mongolian blue spot. And uh, this is another rash, which is very commonly seen. Easily more than 50-60% of the baby would have that rash. Uh, these are basically, we call this a neighbor simplex, huh? or common terms they call salmon patch, or sometimes they call it angel kiss or stop bite marks. Uh, typically seen over the face, uh, over the forehead, uh, can be uh, uh, around the eyes, uh, under the nose or below the chin. Basically, these are the congregation of those uh, small capillaries under the skin. It becomes more red or more obvious when it is crying or be straining because of the congestion of the blood under the skin. Um, this is a self-limiting condition again, and uh, over the next uh, by 18 months, the latest, you know, majority would have disappeared. But uh, if you see there's something rash like this on the forehead on the front of the face, you look carefully at the back of the uh, hairline. 50% of the time, they would have a similar rash, but the one at the back of the hair will not disappear over time. But uh, cosmetically, it won't be very concerned because the hair will be covering the rash. Uh, there's another one which is uh, not uncommonly seen. We call it strawberry hemangioma. This is again uh, those uh, abnormal, uh, tiny capillary growth uh, under the skin. Uh, it's a benign thing, yeah, but uh, it can grow uh, quite rapidly depending on the site of it. You know, sometimes you need the early treatment. Majority of them, they will not be appear at birth. Like what they showed here at birth, there's nothing over this region, the forehead of the baby, there's nothing here, right? At two weeks, when we come follow up, you know, you can see some something like a mosquito bite mark starting, erupting here. And over time, you know, by uh, fifth week and eight weeks, we can see the thing grow very fast. This uh, strawberry hemangioma typically grows very fast within the first two, three months of the baby's life. And over time, you know, by seven, eight months, you start to flatten, you start to stop, cease growing, increasing, cease increasing in size. Uh, the growth will start to re, uh, re resolve and then the thing will start to involute. That means it will resolve, flatten the thing and over the time, say two to five years, it will disappear. Majority will disappear completely but some will have some residual stain here. And now we go on to this uh, common pigmented nevus or called moles. Huh? It's very common. Um, normally it can occur uh, any part of the body, typically over the trunk or sometimes over the limbs. Uh, majority of the time, it appears, uh, it looks very small. It will be probably less than 1.5 centimeters. It's considered small. Uh, there is the most common ones, uh, the small uh, small nevus or small moles, less than 1.5 centimeters. It occurs uh, about 1% of the population. For the bigger ones, between 1.5 to uh, 20 centimeters size, is considered moderate size. This occurs probably about six in uh, 1,000 uh, babies. 
and uh, some of the condition they carry is uh, more than 20 centimeters we call it giant melanocytic nevus like this one giant melanocytic nevus this is very uncommon this is one in 500 uh, population of the newborn babies depending on the site of distribution uh, sometimes like over here is over the lower trunk is being described as a, a swimming trunk uh, giant melanocytic nevus the uh, only concern about this giant nevus is that uh, uh, there's a possibility that you can turn into a malignancy over, over a period of time. And um, treatment, you know, you need to do an earlier treatment. Um, there's no standard guidelines for treatment. People use uh, laser treatment, they use combination of laser as well as sometimes you will need to use the full thickness excision. That means you've got to excise the whole lesion and do some skin graft. Okay, some other uh, common things that is uh, seen will be this uh, what is pork iron stain. Eh? This is a pinkish or reddish uh, uh, flat uh, rash over the face. Normally, it occurs uh, according to the distribution of the uh, fifth cranial nerve. So there will be this ophthalmic division here. It is occurs covering above the eye level and uh, somewhere around the malar region and also somewhere below, somewhere near the uh, mandibular region here. The uh, like this, these three children, like the first child here, the actually this, uh, the distribution actually occurs covering the uh, ophthalmic, which is above the eye, the mid face, and also somewhere around the mandible, the chin area. Um, with this sort of uh, wide distribution, you have to follow up the child because uh, if anything that the rash involves above the eye, like this two child, you have to refer to the ophthalmologist because uh, it can be associated with the uh, glaucoma. Um, there's a condition when there's a uh, pot vine stain involving this uh, large extension, uh, last uh, extensive areas of the uh, face. And if you follow up the child, the child has got some learning difficulties or epilepsy. That's what we call a Sturge Weber syndrome. But uh, for this child here, because it's below the eye, okay, there's no involvement of the eye. Okay, but uh, it would be good to refer to the ophthalmologist to have a first uh, uh, initial evaluation. But for these two child, definitely you need to uh, follow up them for longer term to look for glaucoma. Further, there are some of the so-called this sort of uh, uh, reddish or grayish kind of uh, stain on the skin, very regular surface. Okay, it can be comes in different sizes. If it just occur one or two spots, normally it's not so significant. This is called a cafe or lace spot. For darker skin patient, normally our uh, babies normally you can see the pigmentation is darker colored and compared to those uh, fairer skin the babies um, of course if it occurs in the bigger patches and it's more than uh, five uh, over the body it can be associated with the condition called neurofibromatosis but uh, by itself you know it is not significant um, you will not uh, uh, grow very fast uh, as, as a child grows and uh, don't need any treatment for that and another, we call this lightly patch, you know, hypopigmented patch, we call ash leaf macule. Eh? So also it's a flat area of this so-called, uh, so-called um, hypopigmented areas, normally occurs over the trunk. If it's more than two of those things on the trunk, if it's more than 0 0.5 centimeters, it may be significant as uh, it can be associated with a condition called uh, 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 tuberous sclerosis. So this is um, getting very common, uh, diaper rash eh, due to the uh, urine uh, which is not being uh, uh, the baby when they pass urine doesn't be properly clean so they cause all this erosion around the buttock area around the diaper area sometimes can be very bad and even to the extent of uh, causing ulceration as well but with proper treatment this can resolve within a few days period and uh, not uncommon also over the diaper area we can see this candida infection fungal infection because if it's uh, not being properly maintained the hygiene so the difference from this candidiasis over the uh, earlier uh, diaper rash is that in this candidiasis we tend to see a lot of these uh, satellite lesions small lesions around the big patch here and also the folds you know the folds over the uh, uh, the perineal folds will be involved as well uh, if it's just uh, due to a simple or uh, urine ammonica or, or diaper rash Normally, the folds are spared, but for infection candidates, the folds are actually involved as well. And this is another common uh, condition we call eczema. Okay, pre pre uh, commonly people refer to as a uh, uh, milk rash because typically it happens or started around the face or cheek region. 
So people conventionally, there's always a belief that oh, because the uh, the baby has not been cleaned properly after the feeding, that the milk actually cause this uh, eczema. But this is basically is an atopic, uh, some underlying uh, skin allergy problem. It can appear in the small patches or it can appear over extensive of the whole face. But with proper treatment, it can come back normal without any scarring. Right. Now we'll go on to the common problems encountered by uh, parents uh, normally to bring up uh, during their consultation. First would be jaundice. Huh? Jaundice, I think, uh, is very important. It's very common, especially among the Asians. But uh, jaundice within the 20, first 24 hours after birth is always considered to be abnormal because uh, there are some uh, conditions like uh, blood group incompatibility uh, or rhesus incompatibility or sometimes uh, disability deficiency, they can present with early jaundice. Typically, jaundice uh, in the newborn term baby appears about two to three days. And then they slowly climb until the peak of about say five to six days. And by seven days, they will sort of plateau and most of the time, you know, by uh, 10 days to two weeks, they resolve spontaneously. Um, but uh, for preterm babies, uh, you tend to drag on longer. And also for breastfeeding mothers, you probably expect to see the jaundice prolong even up to a period of four to six weeks uh, uh, duration after birth. The reason the baby has been developing jaundice is because uh, of the red blood cells, you know, when the baby is born, the red blood cells normally they are very uh, rich in red blood cells and the red blood cells will undergo uh, lysis. That means to break down the red blood cells when they change over to new blood. And uh, the, uh, once the red blood cells have been broken down, they will, this is a yellow pigment, it's supposed to go to the liver to get processed and excreted, change it to a water soluble uh, form, get excreted in the urine and, and feces. Uh, but uh, for the first week, uh, baby, because the, the liver is not functioning optimally, so the uh, conversion of the uh, in, of this yellow pigment into a water soluble one, which can be easily excreted, is uh, a bit impaired. So you cause sort of accumulate uh, on the skin, and uh, normally it appears uh, from the head. And as the as the severity goes more severe, it goes down to the chest and also the tummy. Uh, it's important to monitor the jaundice, especially the early onset jaundice, or when there's a risk of uh, ABO incompatibility especially when the mother is O positive and the baby is either A or B positive, or those uh, parents are born, uh, uh, babies born with a recess negative uh, mother, and also those with a GSXBD deficiency, um, they have to be monitored. And the breastfeeding babies, they tend to have uh, jaundice very early onset because if the baby is not being properly breastfed and baby is dehydrated. Another common problem they talk about feeding, parents will be worried that, you know, whether my baby is feeding enough or not. You know, and how should I feed the baby? Uh, if you're breastfeeding, normally we ask you to say uh, breastfeeding on demand. On demand means the moment the baby feels like it or the moment you feel your breast is engorged, you just start to feed, uh, feed the baby. You don't need to follow the time strictly. Uh, there's always a belief that oh, you have to feed the baby every three hours, four hours kind of thing. But that's because uh, during the nursery time when baby is born in the hospital, you see the nurses are doing that, you know. Uh, but when you go home, you don't need to follow the kind of sh schedule because you have more time with the baby. You can observe and see what are the cues the baby will tell you, you know, when the baby is hungry. You identify the feeding cues, you can actually feed the baby the moment the baby demonstrates these feeding cues. You don't need to follow the timing. And how much to feed, it all depends on individual. If the feeding is more uh, closer in interval, you feed more regular, you probably feed at a lot lesser volume, but if the baby is able to feed more, um, then the interval gets stretched, get longer a bit. But most of the time, you know, sleeping is another issue, you know, because most of the time the baby actually sleeps more during the daytime and they wake up more frequent at night for feeding. So uh, this uh, causes a lot of uh, trouble uh, for parents, uh, new parents uh, who is unprepared psychologically. Because by the moment you want to sleep at night, you're tired, baby keeps waking up. Uh, crying for care, crying for feed. So, but all this sleeping sort of pattern, you know, they will revert, they will slowly change over, over the period of three to four weeks. Of course, uh, some babies will take about longer, like three to four months. Okay, so you just got to feed as on demand. Another issue they talk about will be abnormal sounds. So normally, the noises from the nose or noises from the throat, uh, which appears something like a phlegm sound, you know. A lot of parents will bring back the child, that, oh, my, my baby has a lot of phlegm. Or probably they believe that you know, this uh, the secretions of weights at birth is not being properly sucked out, which is not true. Okay, 
because when the baby is lying flat, you know, this way flat, okay, and uh, the tongue, because the tongue is relatively big compared to the mouth, the tongue will fall backward. And all the uh, secretions in the mouth, actually, like saliva, will pool over the back of the throat. And um, when the baby breathes, especially at night time, the, the secretions become thickened. They can cause a lot of this noisy sound, you know. And sometimes because the, the, the nose part, the nasal part at the back here is a bit narrow for the baby. So when the tongue falls backward, the upper, upper airway here automatically becomes narrower. So when the baby breathes, it becomes the noise like... <sighs> To sound like this, you know. So they think they're getting parents worried sometimes. Of course, is that especially at night, the sound may be even more uh, obvious, more pronounced. Uh, come to the next will be the stooling. You know, many parents will say that you know what is a normal stool for the baby. You know, they, the baby normally, if they're on breastfeeding, you don't expect them to uh, pass uh, uh, very form stools. Okay, uh, normally the stools will be quite loose or watery. And once uh, the breastfeeding is established, you can even expect that the baby pass less number of stools within a week. They can be either changed, the baby can pass uh, uh, motion once every three to four days or even up to a, a week or 10 days once. It's still common. Most important, if the baby is passing less stool, the stool consistency is normal, the tummy is not bloated, and uh, baby is passing gas, and baby is still feeding well. There's no vomiting. That's very reassuring. Uh, even uh, with many of the formulas, because now they have been actually produced uh, very close to the breast milk, so you don't expect to see uh, the stools become uh, form stools, you know? and unless a small percentage, they have some hard stools because uh, uh, of uh, sometimes uh, protein intolerance or some other problems, uh, over, over concentration of the feed is also possible. Um, eye discharge is very common uh, because uh, the baby's uh, tear duct is not properly formed. So sometimes after three, four days back home, you know, the tears doesn't flow very well and the tears get thickened and then they get crusted, dried up and becomes eye discharge. Most important when you see eye discharge, uh, as long as the eyes are not red, eyes are not swollen, uh, the discharge is not too copious, not too sticky, it was self-limiting, you can just use some saline to wash it and massage uh, the, what they call the nasal lacrimal area, that means uh, somewhere near your uh, the, 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 the the nasal bridge, just the inner part of the uh, eyelid, you just rotate, massage a bit and push down this way to promote the flow of the tears. Um, babies tend to low lose weight within the first week uh, after birth. Uh, that's because uh, the water will lose from the skin. That's why you see the skin wrinkle or sometimes it can peel off. But uh, by and large, uh, they should gain back the, at least the, the birth weight by seven to 10 days. Any weight loss of more than 10% uh, from the baseline uh, need warrants uh, attention and uh, to monitor closely whether baby is feeding well or baby is uh, having some other problems. Uh, vomiting or regurgitation, again, is uh, a very common uh, concern among parents. Huh? But vomiting by definition is the forceful projectile or forceful kind of expulsion of the milk. Unlike regurgitation, which is uh, unforceful, you just sort of spitting or pulsating, spitting of the milk. Most of the baby, 50% of the time, they will regurgitate after feeding, um, even though they've been burped. That's because of the uh, sphincter, the tone, the upper, the, 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 the muscle tone over the entrance of the stomach is not uh, fully developed yet. So once the baby is being fed fully, the tone will get lax a bit as the baby start to um, strain a little bit, especially when the baby is three to four weeks old, you tend to see more frequent of regurgitation. Uh, vomiting, if it's just intermittent, it's all right. But if it's uh, vomiting after every feed and baby appears very uh, hungry after the vomiting, it needs uh, a warrant's earlier attention because it can be uh, associated with uh, some underlying problem uh, of the intestine from right from the stomach to the uh, duodenum or even the large bowel as well. Uh, body temperature for babies is the same as adult uh, for, for, for other children. Okay, the temperature will range between 36.5 to 37.2 or 3. Anything above 37.5 is considered fever. Uh, colic and wind uh, will not appear very early. Probably you can uh, we expect uh, uh, babies to have this problem when they're about 3 to 4 weeks old. Um, the reason unknown sometimes can be associated with some milk intolerance problem, either lactose intolerance or uh, protein uh, milk protein intolerance. 
but the colic and wind problem rarely occurs, uh, rarely seen in those babies being breastfeeding. Uh, immunization, uh, we have our country, we've got a very good immunization coverage. And uh, since last year, I think even the government, they are giving uh, this the new mucoco vaccination, which has not been given previously. Um, and every newborn baby is given uh, their immunization record, the card or in the booklet form. Uh, depending on the, which state you are in, like for Perak, you know, they are we are sharing the same booklet with the with the KKM, uh, with the Ministry of Health uh, booklet, so it's easier to streamline all this immunization. And um, just to run through, uh, at birth itself, the baby will be given the BCG and hepatitis B, um, and subsequently, uh, at two months old, they'll be given the combination of hepatitis B uh, plus the diphtheria tetanus pertussis. Uh, 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 intra uh, IPV yeah, injectable poliovirus as well as HIV and uh, uh, pneumococcal vaccination will start from four months, six months, and uh, and uh, uh, fifteen months in government schedule. And uh, mom's measles rubella first dose will be given at uh, nine months old, and uh, second dose will be given at twelve months old, and eighteen months old will get a booster of the uh, diphtheria tetanus pertussis uh, IPV as well as the uh, HIV. Uh, all this uh, can be easily available in your child's uh, uh, birth booklet or any cards you know, given by any other hospitals where your child's delivered. Now, caring of a newborn baby, especially for first-time parents, are very exciting and so scary experience as well. Huh? Uh, so you have to actually uh, be prepared <laughs> to face the challenges, but be assured that the baby will give you a lot of uh, cues, you know, because the baby cannot talk yet. Uh, a lot of cues uh, or non-verbal cues to tell you what she needs or when your baby needs your help. Uh, but of course, failing to notice all these cues will lead on the baby to cry. If you have any questions, always ask the doctor. So infant cues, they're called normally and not they're called non-verbal. Huh? Because if you don't attend to those cues, you miss out the cues, you can pick up the cues from them, baby will cry. And uh, there will be approach cues where babies will show that you know, when baby wants to play with you or when they want to be with you, we call approach cues. There are certain actions the baby demonstrate, you call this withdrawal cues, where the baby is telling you that I, I need a break, I need to rest, I need to sleep. So when you engage with the baby, you must know when the baby wants you to be with them and when the baby doesn't want you to be with them. When the approach cues, uh, for example, this is uh, not a uh, uh, so-called Everything must be there, okay? It depends uh, on individual babies and also the age of the baby as well. For newborn babies, you know, you can see the stealing when the baby starts to stop moving, opening the eyes bright and looking at you. Or uh, even with some smooth movements of the arms and legs, very rhythmic movements. So these are the approaching cues. This is a time where actually you can engage with the baby, play with the baby. And of course, for bigger babies, you know, bigger children, bigger babies, when they're about six weeks or two months old, okay, they will smile at you, they make some cooing sounds. They will start to reach out when they're, say, about five, uh, three to four months old, turning their eyes or head towards you, or they even babble and talk to you. Uh, this, so these are the so-called approach cues when baby wants to be with you, wants to play with you. And uh, there are some withdrawal cues, you know, for babies we have to recognize is that, you know, when baby looks down, or baby just turn the head away, or intermittently baby cry or looks very fussy or sometimes back arching. Uh, this, these are the so-called withdrawal cues. For bigger babies, they may squirm a lot, they may be kicking, yeah? they may be yawning, or they may look very down and then they frown, they even hiccups. And so these are the withdrawal cues. So when you see such a cues, you probably have to tone down your activities, your uh, engagement with the baby. Probably the baby needs rest uh, either by, by themselves or uh, they just need to sleep by then. And uh, not every time uh, babies cry, we need to sort of uh, cuddle or hug the baby, okay? Because uh, babies like adults, you know, we have to learn how to calm ourselves down. There are many ways babies you use to calm themselves down, like sucking on their own fingers, fists, you know, or just sucking on their tongue, or bringing their hands to his or her mouth, changing how the baby her position is laying down and looking or listening to face or voices. So these are the few ways the baby actually is learned to interact with the surrounding and try to calm themselves, which is, I think, is very uh, important kind of a learning experience as well as adjustment uh, uh, for the baby to the new world. 
And uh, how we can soothe the crying baby, there are many ways, okay? So we can talk to the baby, look at the baby, talk in a soft voice, gently. You show the baby your face because uh, even at birth itself, baby would be able to see human face. They can recognize human face very well, especially those uh, 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 parents or mothers or fathers' face. Um, so you hold the baby gently and the arms rock them slowly, walking to walk with the baby, talking in a, uh, in, in a soft voice, uh, giving the baby, offer the baby a pacifier. It's very, uh, it can soothe the baby as well. And sometimes you just do the singing, humming yeah, to the baby. If uh, feeling which some babies, if it's a lot of uh, movements, you know, stretching, kicking away, you can actually gently uh, do swaddle. That means you wrap the baby uh, snugly, but not too tightly in a blanket or even gentle stroke, uh, stroking the baby's body or the baby's head. Um, of course, sometimes you just got to feed the baby, you know, this actually is a way to calm the baby as well. So when the baby, of course, if you see in the nursery, the, the nurses normally are very busy and they feed the baby on a regular basis. But when you go home, as I said, you know, there's a lot of cues, uh, feeding cues the baby will tell you, demonstrate to you when the baby needs uh, to be fed. So when the baby is just uh, about to wake up from sleep, you can see some rapid eye movement under the eyelids. Uh, or baby is uh, doing some sucking movements, you know, uh, of the mouth and on the tongue. Or the baby is bringing the hand to the mouth or some gentle wriggling movements of the body, the hands and the feet. Or when the baby is making some small sounds. So these are the early feeding cues. But if you miss those cues, the baby will probably go back to sleep, you know, within the next few minutes. And then they wake up again. You know, when they are a bit more hungry, they wake up again. They are probably having more uh, uh, bigger movements or even making more noises. But if you miss that again, and then the baby will fall to sleep again over the next uh, few minutes. And then uh, another 10, 20 minutes later, they will wake up. And then they will really say, "I'm very hungry." They cry and yell. So uh, contrary to most uh, people believe who say things that uh, you need to feed the baby only when the baby is crying, or you know, you, if you bottle feed the baby. The baby, you feel the baby need to be fed every three, four hours. So in between of two hours, say plus, the baby is crying. So you say, okay, some parents or caregivers are thinking that, you know, oh, it just fed the baby two hours ago. So it's not the time to feed yet. So just let the baby cry. Uh, sometimes, you know, depends on activity. You know, baby moves more, they probably consume more energy, they probably will feed more regular. So even if it's uh, interval is shorter than the usual ones you don't need to feed the full feed you probably just offer about one to two ounces you know or half the usual feeds and to come the baby that's good enough so that's again is something like feeding on demand oh, this, so this, these are the feeding cues i mentioned earlier okay so the early cues when baby is a bit hungry they move, do some gentle movement stirring opening their mouth you know turning the head and, and uh this are this are sticking a rooting reflex if you miss the the first period then the baby going to sleep very easily over the next few minutes. And then the middle cues, they'll wake up again in another five, 10 minutes later and feeling hungry. Then they'll do a more stretching, bigger movements, increasing activity. And uh, even you can hear this, uh, even when they suck on their the, the, the top, the, the hands and fists, or even sucking on their tongue, become louder. If you still miss that, you know, you're going to the late cues, you know, when they wake up again, they're really, really angry. And this is the time you cannot feed them, you just got to calm them down first before you feed again. Oh, something's wrong with my slide. Uh, is that all? I think there's, uh, I got some more slides, right? Hmm. How to move my slide now? Okay, right, okay. Right, so uh, when we talk about uh, safety care of a newborn, uh, I can't uh, go away without talking about breastfeeding, okay? So breastfeeding, many breastfeeding um, mothers who breastfeed their babies, they always have the doubt whether the baby has been fed adequately. So very important, you have to check with yourself and see, is your baby gaining weight? If you're feeding the baby well, definitely a baby will be gaining weight. But of course, for the first three to five days, you know, or even after a week, baby may lose weight a bit, but it shouldn't be more than 10% of the original weight. And by one week, baby should be gaining back to at least the birth weight. Uh, if a baby is gaining weight, you don't need to worry that definitely your breast milk is adequate for the baby. You don't need to supplement because by supplementing the feed 
and then you are you are actually uh, uh, diminishing the, the the frequency of breastfeeding. So do you know that the more you breastfeed the baby, the more breast milk will be produced in the by your body. And uh, you have to look how does uh, how often does uh, my baby breastfeeding actually again is on demand. It's not on any regular basis. Not that three hourly, four hourly, as uh, as uh, for as a predicted predictable as uh, for this uh, bottle feed baby. So the moment you feel the baby actually cries or squirm a little bit, or the moment you feel your breast is engorged, it's time you can start feeding the baby again. And during feeding, if we, can you hear a baby swallowing? You know? See, if you can hear some swallowing sounds you know, in the throat of the baby, during baby is bread, when the baby is being breastfed, that means the baby actually, the, that means there is breast milk and the baby actually is swallowing. And uh, how do your breast feel after the breastfeeding? Okay, it should be feeling soft and flabby, okay? Uh, but of course, you don't feed the baby. Uh, sometimes if you delay uh, in breastfeeding, your breast may be very engorged and very firm, and the baby have difficulty in lashing on. So you may actually need to express soften the breast a little bit before you put the baby to the breast. And you look at the baby's diaper. If the baby is wetting the diaper regularly, at least uh, five to six diapers are wet a day, that means the baby is getting enough breast milk. And overall, you look at the baby, whether the baby is healthy enough. If you find the baby is healthy, definitely you are breastfeeding uh, very well with the baby and your milk is enough for the baby. And uh, if you come across, if you ever come across this term called kangaroo care, it start off with the kangaroo mother care uh, because this is a, 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 it's a proven uh, strategy, especially for those preterm babies or low birth weight babies less than two kilo. Uh, it helps to maintain the physiological stability of the baby where there's actually direct skin to skin contact, you know, the baby and the uh, caregiver. Um, and by doing this kangaroo care, it increases the immunity of the baby. It optimizes the breastfeeding because the baby can access to the breast uh, easily at any one time when it's hungry. And because of the skin to skin contact with the baby, uh, a mother who is breastfeeding can actually sense the, the feeding cues much earlier and can put the baby in the correct breastfeeding position. And also it facilitates the parent-infant bonding. It started off with a kangaroo mother care, but over the, over the years, you know, it's developed into a kangaroo father care. You can see even the father can uh, uh, have this uh, sort of a blanket with the baby, skin-to-skin -skin contact. Uh, even the baby is in uh, NICU step-down care, you know, where the baby is stable, they can still do this kangaroo uh, care. It can be a kangaroo grandpa care, kangaroo grandma care, kangaroo sibling care. Uh, just basically anyone you know who is looking after the baby can can do such a a maneuver. Um, generally, after the baby is about three kilo, three point five kilo, or as 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 uh, comfortable as possible. And uh, to end my slide, you know, this is, uh, I guess, it's a takeaway message, you know, uh, what are the things to look for, you know, you look for the, uh, during the care of your newborn baby. Anytime a baby is having fever, more than 37.6 degree recurrent, at least on uh, two or three uh, separate occasions, four hourly interval. Uh, so you need to bring the baby to see a doctor. And uh, any change, if you notice any change in the baby's behavior, right, the baby is crying nonstop, you cannot calm, the, just cannot calm the baby, or baby just fussing too much and difficult to be comforted, or sometimes baby may be sleeping too long, uh, too long hours uh, away from uh, longer than what the baby's usual sleep wake pattern. So you have to see the doctor. Uh, when the baby decreases in the uh, uh, feeding, at least if his baby is decreased more than fifty percent of the usual feeds, you have to be very careful, look carefully, and bring this baby to see a doctor. And when the baby is still not wetting the diaper as regular as possible, as, as usual, uh, minimum, the, on average, a normal baby will wet about five to six diapers a day. Or uh, if the baby is having uh, more than four times of watery stools you know, in eight hours, by watery stools, by, by, by definition, it's watery, yeah? it's not loose stools. Um, if the baby is developed a uh, thick yellow eye discharge, you have to see a doctor earlier because it can be some other serious infection involving the eyes. And uh, for the first week or 10 days, when the cord is still attached, you know, look at the cord carefully. Okay, redness and swelling around the cord is important. It can be an early signs of infection, which uh, can be a turn into something serious if you don't attend it early. And uh, when the baby is having jaundice, especially when the jaundice uh, occurs within the first uh, 24 hours, or at any time when the jaundice uh, sort of comes down to the level of the uh, tummy, 
is very important. Or anytime when the baby develops persistent cough, uh, because uh, uh, we can see uh, quite frequent, not uncommon to see pertussis, you know, uh, in a, in a very young babies or even newborn babies uh, of the, about two to three weeks old, because uh, the caregiver, either the parents or other caregivers, having pertussis. Okay, all right. I've come to my end of presentation. Okay, um, now I think uh, I'm open to uh, answer some questions. I'll pass it to you, Akmal. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, we will have our Q&A session now. Okay, let's start uh, with our first questions from the audience. Uh, the question comes from Shanti Krishnan. She asks, can we use Zebamed for the newborn due to the rashes? Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Zebamed actually can be used for newborn rashes. It's not only Zebamed, it can be many other brands. Um, most of the babies can tolerate any aberrants, but uh, some babies with a particularly dry skin, uh, they need to use a more moisturizing uh, cream or lotion. Uh, Sebamed also, I think they've got a different range as well, you know, just for some will be just uh, usual ones, regular ones, or sometimes they'll be more uh, extensively moisturized type as well. You can use it for the rash. And uh, what is the best treatment for chronic eczema? Uh, well, for chronic eczema, basically, for eczema treatment, okay, as a whole, uh, the three sprung. One, you must use a very moisturizing skin wash. Secondly, after skin wash, you have to actually use the moisturizer. And uh, third, if it's the more failing wish, you can still have this inflammation. You have to use some uh, uh, steroid cream, range from low potency to a higher potency, depending on the severity of the cream. But of course, uh, for a long term use, you know, we always try to maintain using the lowest potency steroid, you know, and uh, to, to, to get the best possible uh, uh, control. But uh, for some babies who have been on uh, steroid for long duration or some parents who have got this sort of steroid phobia, they're afraid to use steroid, we can actually use uh, uh, the different creams actually like this, uh, uh, we can, uh, like Anidel or uh, Protopic, we can use it to apply to reduce the inflammation. Most important is to, is to maintain because you just imagine like uh, there's a fire burning on the skin, right, for eczema. Uh, when the steroid cream, you dampen the inflammation, um, but uh, you have to maintain it because uh, even though the skin appears uh, not red, but the underlying inflammation is still ongoing. Uh, so if you stop treatment, when the baby's skin getting better, definitely you're going to recur again. And of course, you have to look at any trigger factors as well. Right. And the answer the questions. The next one okay, is for the third question uh, from Miss Ku Chia Hui. Uh, she was asking about green stool from the newborn. Um, actually, green stool, as long as it's pigmented color stool, is considered normal. Uh, of course, most babies would have uh, yellow stools, okay, but some babies, about five to eight percent of babies, would have this sort of greenish stool. It's again still normal. Green stool normally um, uh, it is more sticky in nature, it's more pasty, and also it smells more. Uh, stronger than the uh, yellowish color stool, but it's still normal. Uh, even some breastfeeding babies, they would have a greenish stool. And some babies, you know, depending on the reaction, uh, uh, response uh, with this uh, milk formula milk that they use, typically if the baby is on this hypoallergenic formula, uh, the stool tend to be more greenish than uh, other babies. But it's still a normal stool. Nothing to worry. Okay, doctor. There's another question as well from uh, Miss Kucha. Who eh? um, can mother continue to breastfeed baby if the baby has lactose intolerance? Um, breast by by if the baby has a uh, lactose intolerance, most of the time they can tolerate breastfeeding very well as well. But uh, a lot of times, this lactose intolerance is being actually uh, overdiagnosed. Uh, and improperly diagnosed, I would say, you know. So, but uh, by and large, breast milk can be fed in babies who is uh, having so-called lactose intolerance because most of the time it's not an actual lactose intolerance. Okay. Doctor, moving on to the next question. Uh, this is from Raja Lachmi. Uh, she has a long question. Hi, Dr. Lee. Good afternoon. As I know, newborn should feed every three to four hours. But at 
they cry every one and a half to two hours and baby has feeding cues. Is it okay to feed them with uh, formula milk in this short interval? And second question, why cannot give water to the newborn uh, when, when to start to give water? Okay, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, okay, um, not every baby needs to be fed every three to four hourly. But of course, if his uh, baby has been bottle fed, bottle fed babies, most of the time, the feeding schedule will be more regular, unlike the breastfeeding uh, uh, babies, because breast milk are easily digestible and you don't get sort of uh, the fullness uh, may, may, may not be very prolonged. Uh, so the baby tend to feed more regular. But uh, even if the baby has been fed, say like uh, interval of after the being feeding, after one or two hours later, baby cries again. Uh, you can actually, if the feeding cues are strong, that means baby is sucking them, you know, baby is uh, uh, squirming a little bit, you know, or crying sometimes, you know, then you can still feed the baby. But of course, the volume that you give may not be as full as the previous feed if you are formula feed the baby. But uh, most of the time, this will not happen uh, uh, very regularly. Uh, but if it's too regular, then you can look into it, see whether your feeding, whether the volume that you give is it adequate or not. And uh, why don't we give water? Basically, baby doesn't need water, especially in the first uh, two to three months of life, because the water that you use to mix uh, uh, your milk, or uh, even especially with those breastfeeding mothers, the water content in the milk is adequate. So you don't need to give water. If by giving water, what happens is that actually, first you probably dilute the gastric juice, or sometimes you make the babies feel uh, full, you know, because. Uh, the uh, water actually is occupying part of the stomach. So that would interrupt the uh, feeding uh, of the baby, the frequency as well as the regular uh, feeding of the baby. If, unless you've started uh, giving some uh, complementary feeding, then I think uh, you can actually start to add some water into the uh, part as part of the uh, 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 regular uh, diet for the baby. Okay, doctor. One last question before we wrap up this session. Um, that's uh, the question is: If mother COVID positive, can she breastfeed the baby or not? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, in the in the beginning of this pandemic, you know, there's always the the, the, the even WHO has recommended or CDC recommended no breastfeeding for those. Uh, uh, mother who is COVID positive, but uh, over time, with more data coming out, uh, now actually it is encouraged and it's permissible that the uh, mother is positive, can, they can still breastfeed the baby. But of course, they will take up the uh, full precaution during feeding, the mother must mask up herself, wash her hand properly, and uh, because when breastfeeding, you're in close contact with the baby within a short distance, so the mother has to mask up. Uh, whether you put a face shield or not, you know, it's, 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 it's not as important as the masking and uh, hand washing, hand hygiene is very important. So breastfeeding with proper SOP uh, maintained by the mother is allowed and is encouraged as well. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, I, uh, thank you for all the questions, uh, all the answers. Um, okay. Uh, I think we can, we will wrap up this session. Um, I am sure all of you have enjoyed this very informative talk and we will look forward to your further participation for tomorrow's talk. Same time on optional nourishment during pregnancy by our dietitian in clinical services. Please follow and like our Instagram and Facebook for more information. Thank you. Keep safe and stay healthy. Have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.